Hey, we've got a new one on the healing bench today. This is a uh, old bit of uh, HP gear. Actually, it's uh, Hewlett Packard slash Yokogawa. It's a collaboration unit. Um, they work together to make this thing. Now, this is the this piece of test equipment is huge. It's um as wide as the uh, the view on my um my camera, and it's like from my fingertip to my elbow deep. It's uh, designed to fit into the uh, into the rack. It's 19 inches wide, and it's probably or what one two three units tall it's a big piece of kit so I'll insert a, um, a picture of this unit uh, on the video now so you can see actually what it looks like and it is a uh, 4276A LCZ meter a inductance capacitance and resistance meter LCZ L for inductance C for capacitance Z for resistance um, this video might be a bit of a long one um, I've gonna I'm gonna do a few f tricky things and we're gonna do a full restoration and uh, get this thing back up and working properly so um, yeah sit back Get your favourite drink and um, follow along. It's gonna. It might be a bit of a longer video than my my usual stuff, but um, basically what this is is, it, as I said, it measures inductance, capacitance, and resistance. Because I've got the um, the key site three four four six one a, which does uh, resistance four y resistance, and it does a little bit of capacitance as well. But I need. I wanted something that's good. That's uh, can I can change the uh, the frequency that I'm measuring at, and I can um, do a few other functions here and there. And uh, I do have another capacitance meter handheld one, the um, the DR5000 uh, or whatever it is, 2000 or 5000 or whatever that one is. It's a common one that's um, pretty good. But I wanted a, uh, a bit more of a boat anchor style thing that I can uh, do some really accurate measurements with. And um, as always, it's a bit of gear acquisition syndrome, yeah, the new toy to play with. So we're going to um, tear this thing apart and uh, fix it up do some capacitor replacements. I believe there's a battery in there that's probably leaked. And uh, also there's an option that I'm going to add. Uh, it's option 001 because you can actually apply a, a DC bias to the uh, test terminals so that the device on the test is biased with a, uh, a DC voltage. Uh, negative 40 all the way to positive 40 so you've got an 80 volt range there. Um, usually if you don't have the, uh, the option installed there's a BNC jack on the back of the unit. That will allow you to connect a uh, external power supply, and you can dial that in with your power, like on the the controls on the power supply to a uh, to give you your DC bias. But option zero zero one, that's a little board that sits in the back there that allows you to internally control the um, the DC bias. So on, from the front panel controls, I can dial it in and uh, get my uh, my DC bias, and um, also it can be controlled over the GPIB or HPIB. The the serial communications that's used by these HPs and other older test equipment um, before they had USB so I can automate my testing as well because that's what the, another use of this unit is actually for um, automatic testing you can build your own test jigs and uh, control uh, binning and that sort of thing binning is where you have a, a, a bunch of components you want to test and you can uh, put them in sort them into bins into uh, containers or whatever so that you have different uh, ranges of tolerance or performance characteristics and you can have like the uh, the center or the uh, the ideal component. Then you drift in one direction, and then the other direction. You can sort them out to see, you know, how how far out some are, or use them for different uh, purposes or less critical applications. But this will allow you to do that in a automated fashion. Um, I probably won't be automating it myself. It's just a bench equipment, but it is very accurate, and that's what I'm interested in. So uh, we're going to tear this thing open, uh, give it a good clean out. And uh, maybe look into building ourselves a uh, option 001. I think I might be able to pull that off because the uh, service manual has a full bill of materials. It has a full schematic, and it has a uh, a picture of the uh, the PCB. Uh, just one side, so I can kind of get an idea of the traces, but also I can get an idea of the uh, the shape of the board. And it looks like it might be a mirror image of an existing option that's already fitted to this, because the option 001 is a very rare option to find separately, almost unobtainium pretty much unobtainium unless it's already fitted so um, if I can make my own I can get the um, the option installed and um, it'll make things a lot easier to uh, to use rather than having to hook up a separate power supply so let's uh, stop talking and let's get into it let's uh, pull this thing apart and I'll start showing you the uh, circuit boards and uh, we'll see what we have to do to get this thing back into a uh, good working condition so we got the motherboard removed Pretty easy, just a whole stack of screws, and then on the back, there's a few uh, connections you've got to desolder for the front panel connections. So just make sure if you do that, take a photo so you know exactly where things go back. They're kind of uh, labelled yellow and HCG, HC, 
LP, LPG, LC, LCG, blue, white, red. But if you take a photo, you're going to be sure to get it back exactly how it was, which is kind of important. Um, but yeah, you can see it's a kind of a simple sort of board. It's just a interconnection board, really. So on this side, we, this is the top side, we've got uh, the controller for the fan, it's a brushless DC motor. The connection to that fan, we've got the uh, three connections here to the option boards. This one's for the comparator board, which I have got here. So you can plug in an um, external control panel, which um, lets you do binning and that sort of thing. And then we've got the uh, HPIB board, or uh, GPIB board, depending on what nomenclature you want to use. And that's just for the, uh, the communications to your computer. Standard sort of uh, connection you see on a lot of older gear. Being replaced these days mainly by USB. And, and this one here is for the uh, DC internal DC offset or DC bias, sorry, the internal DC bias board, which I actually want to build one of those because they're very hard to come by, it seems. Uh, this one here is just for some rear terminals uh, on the, the back panel of the, uh, the device. Our power supply card edge connectors. Then we've got our analog uh, card edge connectors. And at the front, we've got our digital. And this is the area we're going to be playing with. This is a battery that's gone leaky and it's leaked it all over the place. If I get it in the light there, you can see it's all the way up here, comes all the way around, and all the way down here. So I've got uh, some new ones of these. These connectors are not made anymore, but they are the big ones anyway. One, two, three, four, and five. They are a TRW brand, uh, 252 243031. That's the uh, part number. And the uh, ones in the centre here, looks like they've got a HP part number of 1251-2026. But I don't need those, I just need, well I think I just need one here. I might need one here, but this one still looks all nice and shiny. So it looks like, even though we've got the, uh, the stuff is kind of creeped over here, it hasn't gone inside at all. This is the one we've got a problem with. But I've got a few of these coming, so um, if we need a f uh, more than one, I'll have, well, three. I've bought three. That's what the sale was for. So first thing first is I'm going to desolder this and the battery. Then we can see what's inside and what's underneath and clean that up. It looks like we're lucky in that it hasn't come through the other side. Uh, it hasn't come through the vias, the little, uh, the little holes uh, all around the place. It hasn't come through there because often if the uh, acid gets through or the alkaline or whatever that comes out of that battery um, and it blows out your vias, you've got to solder bits of wire in there and um, reconnect those those wires through, but it looks like that might not have happened. I think the uh, the, the solder mask on here has um, kind of protected it relatively okay, so the main damage is just in this corner. So first board I'm going to look at is the uh, logic board right here. It's got three capacitors, got an axial one here and then two radials over here on the bottom right hand corner. And of course it's got that connector, the edge connector, which is all kind of gross and yucky. So I will once again grab a Kim wipe and see how it comes up with a bit of the ISO alcohol. What I'll probably do is also I've got some uh, deoxit, so I'll put the deoxit on there as well. To try and shine these things up a bit because this is where all the uh, electrolyte would have been kind of just marinating the circuit board so we want to get it all off and uh, cleaned up so it doesn't look like we've lost any of the traces Hang on, I'll dry that off. So that's not looking too bad. I mean, definitely needs more of a clean up. But it's not as bad as I was fearing it would be. I almost need like a really, really fine, like a, what do you call it, the uh, fiberglass pens. It's like a 
almost like a, a paintbrush sort of thing, but it's got the fiberglass in the end. You can just gently go along and it kind of just polishes. I might have to see if I can find one of those. I used to have one years ago, but I don't think I've got one currently. But I'll keep giving that a clean up. And we've got to replace the capacitors. So I'll go ahead and uh, replace these caps and uh, have a bit of a go at cleaning this. And we'll see how that comes up once I'm done. So I've cleaned these edge connectors up. Uh, this is a close-up of the uh, the really bad one, uh, the one where I had to re actually replace the uh, the edge connector socket on the, the board. You can see it in the picture there where the, um, the battery is a black square at the bottom. Uh, this is how it looked like when I first pulled it out and I was actually worried that it was going to be um, unsalvageable or at least uh, a bit uh, dubious because it, yeah, it's just so bad. But I, um, I used some vinegar uh, to try and uh, get rid of some of the uh, the battery goop off of there and I use uh, isopropyl alcohol and some distilled water and uh, I actually got a, a, a flat blade screwdriver, a new one that was all nice and smooth and just very, very carefully just scraped between the um, the uh, gold fingers to, to take off the, uh, the hardened sort of stuff from the battery and also just like really super carefully just glided over the gold just to kind of break away any um, any of that green stuff that's kind of like lumped up and uh, hardened there and I managed to chip it off without scratching the uh, the uh, the gold. It looks like someone has had a bit of a go at it before because there's a few grooves not actually through the gold but they've kind of like dented and scratched the gold but it's um it's still in intact so it wasn't so bad. So this is what it looks like once we've actually cleaned it all up and it actually came up really well. I was, I was actually very very happy with um, how it came up. Um, I gave it a uh, a bit of a soak in the uh, deoxid red, the D100, the uh, the full strength stuff, and um, uh, cleaned it, rinsed it, cleaned it, and rinsed it, and yeah, went went pretty hard on it. Not not hard as in scrubbing it, but I, I went really thorough on it to make sure I got rid of all of the uh, the battery stuff and all the corrosion that I, I possibly could, and uh, that's what it's come up like. So I'm actually really really happy with how it's come up, and that shouldn't be a problem. I've put some uh, deoxid gold on all of the gold connectors now, and uh, uh, just to protect it. And um, yeah, I think that's going to work perfectly. So while I was waiting for all the other parts to arrive, um, I thought I would just pull the front board out and give it a bit of a clean up. And I have found another sneaky little capacitor here. A thousand microfarad 6.3 volt uh, axial there. You know Chemicon again, the S, uh, SM series, which is just the standard 85 degree, nothing special series. So um, I'm going to have to go and get another uh, another capacitor to put in there just so we've replaced all of them and uh, I think that's probably just a bulk kind of a, a smoothing capacitor or you know, decoupling capacitor for this board but um, one interesting thing I found, or well, two interesting things I found one is uh, all of these uh, LED displays across the top they're actually socketed so um, yeah if the one goes faulty it's just pull it out and put a new one in assuming you can still source these exact ones but that would um, mean it's not that difficult to change the display color if you really wanted to. You could put blue or white or whatever in, if that was your kind of thing. But yeah, they're all, the whole whole row is all socketed. Uh, the other thing is these switches. You see all these switches here. They've got this funny little mechanism. I'll zoom right in on that and I'll show you how these work. It's a uh, buckling spring style arrangement, except it's not a coil spring like you see in the... Uh, in the the IBM keyboards, the uh, the classic clicky keyboard, but it's got a flat piece of metal here. It's really thin, flat bit of metal. If I press down on that, if you look just up in here, you can kind of see how I'm push, pushing um, pressure, and then it buckles up here. So I'm pushing down here, and it's like it's going from a curve to more of a sharp L shape. And once you reach a certain point, a critical point, that force then can't be held by the spring and it buckles up here and you get that click click a pretty cool little design so I'll angle that up a bit I'll zoom out so we can get the focus you see that there it might be better this way So I've been having a bit of a close look at these switches. Uh, 
and I found out that they're called a Bill West switch or a West switch because that's the name of the guy at HP who uh, invented them. They uh, invented these switches because they found that the the switches at the time, the tactile push button switches they wanted to use, were too expensive. So they've designed their own that were a lot cheaper. Uh, the other problem with these things that I found is that they're very very expensive. Uh, Fifty dollars a pop on eBay. That's one switch, not including the keycap, just the switch mechanism. Fifty dollars each. So um, I don't really want to break any and uh, I want to try and reform these a little bit to make them work a bit better. See what's happening is over time that little leaf spring in there, it rather than being straight it kind of bends and that makes the, uh, the button a little bit sticky and it feels a bit too clicky. Not a nice uh, clicky keyboard sort of clickiness but a bit of a crunchy sort of pressing it too hard feeling. So I'll move the mic and I'll um, show you what they sound like in the close-up. So this one here is one that I haven't uh, worked on yet. There's a definite click to it and it feels a little bit too too stiff. Whereas over here, here's one I've, um, I've fixed. It's a lot softer. It feels nice and it doesn't sound so crunchy and clicky. Basically all I had to do was uh, just... Hang on, I'll move the mic back to my face. All I had to do was just pull that uh, leaf spring out and uh, flip it around just like turn it over on itself so the easiest way to do that is to just get the get some uh, tweezers get under the end here and it'll come straight out like that and you can pull the spring out and if I hold that up you might be able to see how it's got a bit of a a bend to it at the top it's bending just to the left just a fraction that's all it needs that tiny little bend so you want to turn that around so that bend is at the bottom and it's facing up because that's the way that the uh, the spring buckles so if I press this one you see that, that spring buckles up so if you turn it around so that the uh, that bend is facing up it'll kind of help it to to pop upwards and then you just got to uh, slide it back in. It can be a bit tight sometimes. So we'll see how I go. It's a little bit more difficult in front of the camera. Get it in there like that. You can hold it with something like a spudger and you've got to just lift up the front to curl it up and it will sit into a little notch. Just like that. And that is feeling good. Not it hasn't got that loud crunchy click feeling, just a nice soft, not too spongy soft, but it's just got a nice tactile feel to it there. So I got the uh, power supply all done, all the capacitors replaced. Some of them are substantially smaller. These ones here, the 450 volts. I, I'll put 450 volt ones in. Now I think they're a little bit less. I can't remember, but the same capacitance value anyway. They're substantially smaller than these ones. I've still got them here. Uh, just slightly smaller. Over here, it's the same sort of thing. Most of them are a little bit smaller. I've, I've upgraded the, uh, the voltage rating just slightly. Uh, not too much, but just a little bit, so that they are going to be less stressed. And also, they're all 105 um, degree rated. They're all uh, United Chemicon or Nippon Chemicons, uh, as the old ones were. But the old ones were the SM series, which is that uh, the uh, 85 degree standard capacitor. There's nothing special about them. They they weren't low ESR or they weren't high ripple rating. But I've put all um, high ripple rating, and uh, like the uh, they can handle a high amount of voltage ripple and current ripple. And also their lower ESR as well, so that should work quite well and for a long time. Also, the uh, the two capacitors down there, the, those two grey ones, they were those bad reefer uh, mains filtering caps. So they, these ones are uh, I can't remember what brand, maybe Panasonic or uh, or something. Anyway, they they're a good one, so they won't be a problem anymore. Uh, no more fires or potential for fires, and. Uh, yeah, we're ready to put the uh, the case back on. Uh, once we put the case on, we've got two adjustments here 
frequency adjust, F adjust, and voltage adjust is labeled V adjust. Um, and we've got a whole bit of test points along the top here. So once we put that in and got all the machine back together, uh, we can stick our screwdriver through the holes in the uh, in the, the cover and tweak that and measure the points that we're told to measure in the uh, service manual and get this thing all tuned up and putting out the uh, the correct voltages. And here are those reefer caps which are replaced as well. So these things tend to crack and uh, these ones are just starting to go a bit funny. But uh, what happens is the, uh, oh, that side's a bit worse I think, you can see a split all the way across. What happens is they split open like this, the epoxy ages with the heat and splits and it swells a bit and then the uh, humidity in the air gets inside and it corrodes the, uh, the aluminium foil inside and then causes a short. These things then catch on fire and let all the smoke out and can be quite destructive. Look at the other side of this one. So yeah, you, these these style, you definitely want to replace them. If ever you see them, they come in different sizes and different capacities and stuff. But if you ever see this style, check them out um, and throw them out. Pull them out, throw them out and put some uh, new ones in because they, it's not a matter of if they'll go bad, it's a matter of when they'll go bad. They, they definitely will. These are cracked. Not the worst I've seen, but they're definitely not the best. And uh, yeah, just get rid of them. So here we've got the uh, analog board. Um, I've replaced all the electrolyte capacitors with uh, new ones. They're just uh, decoupling and uh, supply filtering that. Nothing too major and too critical at all. Um, also, I replaced these two capacitors here. As you can see, um, the old ones, they're looking a bit weird. I think that's something that's come out of the battery. It must have evaporated and it's uh, affected whatever is in the coating on those particular capacitors on that brand. And nothing else in the, the machine was uh, looking like that at all. It was only those two capacitors. So they're cheap. I figured I might as well replace them. And uh, be spe it's better safe than sorry. I don't want them to burn out and some kill something critical in the rest of this circuit. And, you know, you know if something like these hybrids here go bad or there might be some sort of a specific chip that if that dies, then it might kill the whole board, you know might make the whole board unrepairable. So um, those two have been replaced, all the electric electrolytics are replaced and also I found that the uh, gold edge connectors down the bottom here, uh, there was nothing wrong with them so uh, I just gave them a bit of a bit of a clean, a very gentle clean and a bit of deoxid gold just to make sure that they stay nice and clean and tarnish free and uh, this one is ready to go back into the unit. Here we are with a completed motherboard, all ready to go back together. So um, down here I scratched off all the green uh, solder solder mask, but I was going to replace it with this stuff. The uh, UV curing uh, goop that you put on there, if that's going to focus. Just some stuff from eBay. But um, I decided I'm not going to for a couple reasons. Uh, the first reason is that I can't be bothered. <laughs> I was going um, to do it, but I did some few tests and uh, I just couldn't get it right in the uh, in a small window of my patience so um, I decided now yeah, I need some practice and now's not the time I just want to get this thing back together because it's taken up too much space in my room so I uh, decided that I'll just leave it it's a uh, tinned copper anyway so it's no worries to leave that that open it's just a cosmetic thing but it's in the enclosure and I'm not gonna see it so I don't care so that's the first reason. The second reason is that if by any chance there's any uh, of that battery goop left, I don't want to trap it underneath. I've washed it with vinegar and isopropyl alcohol and water and scrubbed it and rinsed it and rinsed it and scrubbed it and all that. So it's pretty much perfectly clean, but I um, I figured, eh, just on the off chance, I'll just leave it. Um, I'll probably make a mess of it if I tried to replace the green, and um, it'll look worse than what it is anyway. Uh, so that's how it's going to stay. So I've also replaced the uh, battery here. Uh, new NICAD 2.4 volt which matches the uh, the old battery and this is a 300 milliamp hour which is a higher capacity. I can't remember what the capacity of the old one was but it wasn't 300 milliamp hours, a lot less. The cells were much smaller but I can't get that uh, form factor battery anymore so we're going to use this one which is fine because that's going to be mounted off the board so if in the future this does leak uh, it won't leak onto the board and we won't have this whole problem a second time. So that's going to be fine. Uh, I've also replaced this plug here and I got exactly the same one and um, the only difference I can see is that this one says TRW cinch but these ones just say TRW but apart from that they are exactly the same part number exactly the same part so that's going to mean the uh, edge connector card is going to sit in there perfectly if I use a different brand there's a chance that um, 
it could be offset or a different height or whatever and that's going to cause problems so that's good that i got these new old stock uh, connectors and um, it matches perfectly the other thing that i've done is i've uh, traced out this connector here for the old fan which i'm replacing with this fan a uh, san ace 60 a 60 mil fan uh, this is going to plug into here and i found that there's a negative which is the top top terminal and then the bottom terminal is the positive 8 volts i'm using a 12 volt fan it's going to be under volted to 8 volts that's fine it just means it's going to run a bit slower and quieter and last longer this is a bull bearing fan and i um, i chose a, a quiet one so it's going to be almost silent so that will plug in directly into there, the top and the bottom. Bottom is positive, top is negative, perfect. I'm going to leave the old fan controller uh, PCB in there because there's no reason to remove it. It's going to sit there doing nothing anyway. And um, it, just for completeness sake. So in, if in the future um, I manage to get the uh, a, a new old stock fan and I decide to put it in just so it's all original, or if someone in the future does, that'll be in there ready to go. No worries. There's no reason to remove it anyway. It's just a pain in the bum to do that. So that's all sorted there. Also, I've uh, gone and made some PCBs for the uh, A22 board, option 001. This is a DC offset board or the DC uh, output board. I uh, basically copied the outline of the uh, original and um, I copied the placement of the, the components and I've just put my own traces in to suit that. So there's a few sm uh, small differences which I'll run through on the uh, completed board, which looks quite nice if I might say so myself. On the original, um, these this row of uh, components, the the resistors there, not including the N one, but all of those there, was in uh, were in one uh, package. Same with these ones here, and I believe maybe these one these four here, they're all in like a single kind of multi pack of resistors. But because they're all different values, they were a HP specific part. They weren't all like 10k or 1k or whatever. So um, they're basically unobtainium, so I've just gone with discrete resistors, no big deal. 1% resistors is fine. Also, I cross-referenced all of the uh, transistors here to modern equivalents. Uh, I can't remember. Oh, 5551s and 5401s. Um, because the ones that the, uh, the HP were using are also almost unobtainable. Um, you can get them, but they're expensive and they're big and uh, these are cheap and much easier to get. So I've cross-referenced those. Also... Um, the other thing that I couldn't cross-reference was this one here, this LF13331D, which is an analog switch, basically a silicon uh, version of a uh, relay. Also this one here, the AD7530LN, which is a uh, high-precision digital-to-analog converter, but it's a ladder resistor style, which I've found one they still make, but it doesn't quite match up. So there's a possibility that these can be cross-referenced to other things, but I could get these two... Actually, I've got four of these, uh, four chips, two of this and two of this, and they'll cost me 20 bucks. So uh, $5 a chip, it's doable for a one-off um, option board. So that was... Uh, bit more than I wanted to pay but it's not it's not bad at all really for um, obsolete and uh, out of date chips but these are uh, these two the 74HC273 APs they are still available for a couple cents or well, 50 cents or a dollar from DigiKey and this one is a TL074ACN is the one I use a TL074 that's a jelly bean part you get those anywhere not a problem at all also the other part that uh, is expensive but still a able to get is this diode here. It's a high precision diode. Um, it's a Zena and it's set to 6.2 volts. I believe in the um, 6.2 or 6.3. I can't remember what the, the standard value is but in the HP manual it says it's either 6.3 um, and the standard is 6.2 or it's 6.2 and the standard is 6.3. I can't remember which way around it is. Anyway that's fine because we can adjust the offsets and the uh, calibration with these pots and that has got a very 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 minuscule tiny uh, temperature coefficient so as the temperature changes that uh, the value of that doesn't change barely at all and the reason we want a good one there is because that is the voltage reference for the a to d converter so as the temperature changes that means that the a to d converter isn't going to be changing isn't going to be drifting in the breeze and then our output voltages are going to be rock solid so you, you could use a standard zener there if you want but it's not going to be nearly as uh, as accurate and you're not going to be running at the uh, original hp specs so I'll um, put a, a Gerber and the various files for this on 
or in the description below and you can um, build one of these yourself if you feel like it. I got this made at JLC PCB, no affiliation or no uh, sponsorship there, but I found they were good for um, making this because they can uh, actually bevel these edges where the uh, edge connector goes in, whereas Seed Studio doesn't do that. They don't have that uh, that service. And also I got it uh, gold plated just so it's um, nice connections there. It was not going to corrode and it's going to give me a good connection into the, uh, the socket because that sits like that. Perfect. Um, I've still got to make the uh, aluminium back piece, but um, I'll do that near the end. Also, I went and made this one, the HP 4276A Option 001 Extender Board. This is actually a HP part, which you used to be able to get. Um, part number 04276-66562. Uh, that is used in here. So when you want to uh, calibrate this, you need to have it plugged into the device. But if you open the, the box, you're going to affect the airflow in there and also you have to open the box. So what you do is you pull this out of the back of the unit, you stick this one in, and that extends this connector out the back to here. And then you can plug this one in here, and then you can calibrate it and set the, the voltages and whatnot. Once that's set, you can just put it all back and it's going to be set perfectly. And you don't have to worry about going inside the... Uh, inside the enclosure. Perfect. All right, before I go on ahead and put this all back together, um, I'll talk about this here because I've done a little bit of work here as well. So if I zoom in here, this is the back of the front terminals. So you can see, and I'll move those cables out of the way a bit more. Okay, you can see there, there's a couple of diodes, a few capacitors. Now one of these capacitors was actually a chipped and um, I wasn't happy with that. So I've replaced those capacitors, they're disc ceramics with uh, these uh, little MLCC ceramics or whatever they are. So they're the equivalent ratings. And I've also replaced the diodes too because these are protection diodes. I don't know how much uh, abuse they've taken. And also I found one wasn't actually soldered on there correctly. So um, I just went ahead and just replaced all those with new ones. And uh, that way I know that they're all good. They haven't taken any good ESD hits and uh, potentially gone faulty. And uh, resoldered them all so they all got a good connection because, um, like I said, there's one that was a bit dodgy and some of these solder joints were a little bit bleh. But now they're all good, so uh, they're going to do their job and filter out any uh, noise coming in and also um, give me some protection on the input. All right, all done. So we got all the boards back in, all the capacitor replaced, we've fixed the motherboard, we've replaced the battery, fixed that cartridge connector, everything's all back in into one piece. No missing screws, no leftover parts, so that's good. Um, I changed how I was going to um, replace this fan. So I was going to wire the fan directly to the motherboard, but in the end I, um, I used the old wiring harness from the old fan, which is coming up here somewhere. It might be a little bit dark, but you might be able to see it. Um, it turns out that the uh, brown wire, if you're following along at home, uh, can connect directly to the positive of the fan, and there's a black wire which comes up to the external trigger connector, which is just here. It's the ground for the external trigger, and it grounds the case as well. Uh, that can uh, be connected directly to the negative of the fan, and that will give you 8 volts, and it will work as designed, as, as we want. So um, that's all done. So on to the next step. Alright, so ready to test. I've got the uh, bit of paper here that tells us what we're doing here. I can see it on the PCB, but I'll just put that for uh, your benefit so you can see exactly what I'm testing. I have my uh, cable for the uh, frequency testing here, and my cable for the, uh, the voltage testing here. I've disconnected the fan for now, um, don't need it for this sort of test. And uh, I also have my insulated little screwdriver thingy, which is going to go in there and adjust our voltages and our frequencies. So the first thing we have to do, according to the uh, instructions, is to test our 5 volts, the 5 volt dig, digital 5 volts. So we'll hook that up and uh, give it a test and see what we get. Okay, so we got the... Uh, Digital ground test point two and five volt digital, and we are getting 5.4. Now, the uh, manual says we should be getting uh, where are we? It should be 5.1 volts plus minus 0 0.01 volts, so between 5.99 and 5.11, and we're a little bit high. So, if I turn that down. How accurate can we get? Not down a little bit too far. 
I reckon that's pretty good. So 5.100, spot on. All right. So the next step is to uh, test test point 5, 6, and 7. That's plus 16 volt, minus 16 volt, and plus 8 volt. And we want those to be, uh, the plus 16 wants to be between plus 15 and plus 17. The minus 16 wants to be between minus 15 and minus 17. And the 8 volt wants to be between 8 and 10. So let's give that a quick test. Uh, plus 16, we've got 15.6, so that's fine. Minus 16 is 15.6, so that's fine. And the 8 volt is 8.7, that's Fine, eight point, nearly eight point eight. So that's that's perfect. All right. So now we want to test the frequency. So I want to get my uh, Nixie frequency tester set up. Okay. So according to the instructions, we should be testing between the digital PWM, that's uh, test point nine, and ground, which is test point ten, and we should be getting. 21 kilohertz plus or minus 0.1 kilohertz and uh, we are at 19.5 so we're at quite a bit low there so if I tweak that 21.6 we'll go a little bit down just gotta dial this in a bit Come on, give me that, there we go, oh, yes, okay, that's good enough, 21 plus minus 1 kilohertz, so we can be 21.1 or 20.9, and we got 21.006, so we are spot on, perfect, all right, now what's the next step is to, that's it, that's it for the uh, voltage, all right, so it's about time that we um, have a look at this, uh, circuit here, this uh, option board. I've started to do the calibration as prescribed in the manual and I found that's a bit of a problem and um, I think I know what the problem is. So I'll turn this unit on and I'll set it up so that's um, how it should be according to the manual and uh, we'll have a look and I'll show you what the problem is. Alright, so I'll turn it on and the manual states I should set the DC bias to 9.99 volts. So we hit the DC bias button here, turn on the option, and then I should turn that up to 9.99 volts. Eight, nine point nearly, ne there we go, so 9.99 volts, so now we'll be putting out 9, should be putting out 9.99 volts out the back of the unit. So you can see there we're at 9.65-ish, 9.6. We need to get that to 9.99 to match what we got in the front panel. So if I turn the FS adjust pot, I've gone maximum in the uh, on the range on that pot, and we're at 9.93. It doesn't go far enough. We can't get to 9.99. There's a problem somewhere. I think I know where the problem is, so what I'll do is we'll have a close look at this board and um, I'll explain what I think is going to fix this. Alright, so here's a close-up of the uh, the circuit board, the uh, option board. I've removed it from the um, the machine. Now here's the, uh, the adjustment, this uh, pot here, the FS adjust. You can see, if you look closely, the arrow here is pointing all the way up this direction. That's at full scale. If I turn it back around, the voltage is going to drop. So we can't go any higher because the pot won't let us. So we've got to figure out how we can get more range on this pot or shift the range so that we can um, get the right adjustment. Now, this diode here is a, a, a super a super low temperature drift uh, Zener diode. It's got incredibly low uh, drift with temperature. So um, that is actually what's giving us the uh, the voltage reference for our A to D converter, which is this one here. Um, it gives us a, a very accurate uh, 6.2 volts because, um, well, uh, HP they specify 6.3, but you can't get a 6.3 Zener. You're going to get 6.2. And I think what happens is uh, HP characterized the um, the diodes and picked the ones that they uh, wanted that were 6.3, or they spoke to the manufacturer and got the manufacturer to characterize them and only send them ones that were 6.3 volts, because 
the uh, range of this diode actually covers 6.3 volts. If you buy the 6.2 volt, there's a tolerance on uh, what the actual Zener voltage is, and it can cover 6.3 volts. But whatever it is, it is very, very accurate at that uh, arbitrary value if the temperature changes. So if this turns out to be a 6.25 volt um, uh, Zener, then it will be that exactly. And if the temperature goes up and down, it will barely drift at all. So that's why we have this uh, this pot here, so that we can um, we can calibrate for the uh, slight uh, variance in Zener voltage of that diode. But because it's not a 6.3 volt, it's a 6.2 volt. I think that's what's soaring off this uh, pot here. So um, I've got the uh, the full schematic. I'll zoom out a bit so we can see it. Oops, wrong way. Uh, about there, that'll do. Most of this stuff we don't need to worry about because it's all the um, other stuff. What we're worried about is up here. So um, this here is our, no, sorry, this one here is the FS Adjust. It's a, a 2K potentiometer, and that dials our um, output voltage up and down to calibrate from what we set. So basically we have the input over here. It comes through these uh, two chips here. We've got some switching stuff going on to switch ranges and that sort of thing. And it ends up going through these uh, these channels here, come through to our A to D converter. Uh, sorry, A to D. D to A converter, digital to analog converter. Through some op amps, we've got some more range switching here. And then comes through another op amp. These are like just for buffers and that sort of thing. Through our transistors, and whatever analog output is coming from uh, this chip here, comes through here. Then we've got a, uh, like a, a push-pull bipolar style amplifier and then our output voltage comes out of here now the offsets we got a zero adjust here and a zero adjust here so we can set our zero points and they work perfectly this one here actually calibrates the um, the absolute output voltage and it's not working right but you can see we got this uh, resistor this variable resistor is our pot but in line is a 29k resistor so basically we're varying from uh, 29 to 32K because we've got 2K um, pot. So if you turn that all the way down, so you see this arrow here, if that comes all the way across to this side, we're basically shorting out the resistor. So that means we've got a 29K resistor. If we turn it back all the way this way, we end up with a two resistors, a 2K plus a 29K, we got 31K. So it's 29 to 31K. The thing is, you can't get a 29K resistor. Well, you can, but it's not a common size. It's 1% you know, resistors. You've got a 28.7 or a 30K. Now, I went for a 28.7K uh, resistor, and I substituted it in there, because 28.7 is pretty close to 29. It's a little bit lower, uh, like by 0.3K, but it's closer than 30. But it turns out, I think with this, being, this, uh, this one here being slightly lower, and our Zena diode, which is sitting over here, doing our reference, being a different voltage, it's meant that those two have kind of added up and pushed my range of the, uh, the pot the wrong way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a uh, potentiometer in and um, in place here as well. I'm going to dial that around. So I'm going to set this to, to the centre scale, about 1K, around about. I'm just going to dial it in like with the, uh, just kind of turn it around about halfway. Then I'm going to play with this one to then calibrate to as close as I can get on a, uh, a cheap pot to a 9.99 volts. Then when I desolder that again, I'll measure it and see what it says. And whatever that says, that's what I'll put in. So I'm, well, the closest value of a standard resistor. And I'm guessing I'm going to be putting in a 30K. So I should have gone the other way. not I should have gone up and not down. If that's all I need to do, then that's the only change. I'll just change that value on the schematic so that uh, in future I know which one to use and that should be fixed. So um, I'll go ahead and put the pot into here. It's actually uh, the third resistor along here from the left. This one right there. That's it. So I'll replace that with a uh, just a little uh, standard kind of volume style pot. You know, just a up and down turny thing. And uh, we'll dial it in and see what it says. See if we can get this thing spot on. I also have some uh, 10 turn pots. Um, I'm going to put those in as well uh, once we've finished playing around and uh, hopefully we get this thing really accurate. Alright, so I've got the uh, potentiometer 
white in there, set to half scale, and I've got the uh, the FS adjustment pot set to half scale as well. So they're ready to go. And I've got the uh, wire plugged into my multimeter. You can see here it says external input or internal monitor. The external input, if I don't have this board, that's where I can connect up a external power supply to inject the voltage that this is otherwise making. But because I've got that board plugged in, it becomes an external monitor, so I can plug that into a voltmeter and uh, monitor the exact output, just as we're doing right now. Okay, so I've got the front panel set to 9.99 volts as before, as uh, it says to do in the uh, manual, and I'm getting 9.17, 9.179. So we're a bit low. So if I grab this pot and give it a bit of a tweak, that's gone down, we'll come back up. We're going to get to 9.99, as close as we can. Oop, too far. It's going to be really touchy, so... Oh, that's pretty good. Okay, that's good enough for me. 9.991, 9.90. That's going to drift because it's warming up. I'll give that a sec, and then I'll um, I'll give it a tweak, and then we can measure what this thing is actually at. All right, so time to measure the uh, resistance. So I'll hook the uh, probes up. And then if we look at the uh, multimeter, 29.7, so 30k. That'll be the, uh, the right way to go. So I'll stick that 30k in, and um, we'll see what it says once I power it back up. All right, so we're set up here. We've got the uh, new resistor in, and I've changed these to the uh, Dachi uh, 30 turn pots, I think. So they're real precise. Um, Bourne's brand, so they're um, pretty good with only 100 parts per million uh, temperature drift. And all these other small, like the uh, standard resistors, they're all at 50 ppm or better. So, not a problem with the temperature drift. You can see we're at 10.03. And I should be able to turn that down. If I can keep the screwdriver in there. There we go. Should be able to get that pretty close. I'll carefully dial that in. I should be able to get it real good. Look at that. That is well beyond spec. The spec says it should be, um, what do we say here? 9.99 volts plus or minus 0 0.002. So here, where the few. Uh, points over in um, accuracy so that is spot on fantastic all right next step is to uh, see how it goes actually measuring stuff I guess once I get this uh, I get this fan reconnected then I can put the uh, whole thing back together and um, yeah start testing things all right time to take this baby for a spin we got the uh, key side on top here um, I know this one is accurate because it is brand new and it came with a cow certificate and it's still within the um, calibration time so we'll test on this and then we'll um, compare it with the uh, the uh, 4276 now I'm not sure what uh, frequency this uses to actually test the capacitors I've been through the manuals and that and it doesn't actually tell you it tells you how it measures but it doesn't tell me the frequency of the measurement so I've set this one here to one kilohertz just as a nice round number and we should get pretty close between the two um, the, basically, the way these things measure is um, they'll charge the capacitor up to a certain amount and then they discharge it through a, a known resistance. In this case, it's 100 kilo ohm for the uh, key site. And then it will measure the, uh, the voltage drop over that discharge time through the known resistor. And then it, from that, you can calculate what the capacitance is. So um, if you with this one here, I've found that uh, if you measure a very big capacitor, like one of these, you can't measure it at a high frequency because it charges up and discharges too quick for it to get any meaningful uh, reading of a larger capacitor so you've got to set it to a uh, lower frequency so we may have to do that I'm not it might all work on one kilohertz but if I set this up to uh, 10 kilohertz or it goes right up to 20 kilohertz um, it won't read the larger values you have to turn that frequency down so um, we'll um, try a few capacitors we've got a uh, a uh, poly 
polypropylene uh, film cap here. This is a orange drop, I think they're called. Often used in valve amps and um, guitar amplifiers and stuff. So we'll hook it up to the key site. It's a 224 is written on there, and we're getting 0.22 microfarads, so that's pretty much spot on. And if we hook it up to the uh, Hewlett Packard, we're getting almost the same. A little bit lower, we're getting 0.229, but we're getting 0.2208. So there's a slight difference, but that might be the uh, measurement frequency, because capacitors will change their capacitance. Um, depending on what frequency you're measuring them at. But that's within the ballpark anyway. And the uh, it, it's not going to show us ESR. Um, I guess it's too low. But on the um, electrolytics it will show us. So let's try electrolytic now. This is a 100 microfarad. So let's put this one onto the key site. And it should show us pretty close to 100 microfarad. There we go, 90, 93. So this is like a 10% part, so that is well within tolerance. There shouldn't be a problem because this thing is brand new, so that's reading good. And then on the um, Hewlett Packard. Yeah, there we go, we flicked over to ohms there. So we're getting 0 0.11 ohms, and it's reading 92.1, so that's still within the ballpark. It seems to be working well. Uh, let's give another one a go. What's this one? 470 microfarad. So we'll hook that negative to negative and positive to positive on the key site. Overload. Oh, there we go. 409 microfarad. 408 microfarad. So it might take a little... It Sometimes it will take a little while to just settle because of um, absorption and that sort of stuff. But we're getting about 410, so let's see what that says on here, on this one. Give it a second. 411, so that's 409-ish, 410-ish, that's pretty good compared to this one. And we're getting 0 0.069 ohms, so the ESR on that one is fine. And we'll try a big one here. This one is a Sprague Powerlytic. It's a... Um, 13,000 microfarad. Now the key site won't read it. Um, it's above its range, but we'll try it anyway. And it's just going to say overload. Doesn't matter how long we hold it there, it's just going to be overload because it's way above what it can read. And that is one of the reasons why I got this uh, Hewlett Packard. Because if I Hook that up. I'll drop them. Now this is probably one of the re the times when I'm going to have to drop the uh, frequency down. 120 hertz. There we go. So that's gone up to uh, millifarad, so that's the next one up from microfarad. And we've got 15. And this one is rated to 13. But the um, tolerance on these is like negative 10 to plus 75%. So that is well within its um, rating. And the ESR is nice and low, 0 0.041 ohms. 0 0.04 ohms-ish. So this capacitor is good. I got one more big one to try. This one is a 3600 microfarad. You can see there it says uh, minus 10 plus 75. For these big caps, these um, the older large caps, that was often the uh, ratings. So let's see what the uh, key site says. It's going to say overload as well. Nothing. That's not a problem. We'll stick it on the uh, Hewlett Packard, positive to positive, negative to negative. Two point six. Now this is supposed to be three point six, so we've dropped a thousand microfarads. So this one is no good. The uh, ESR is point one seven ohms, so the ESR ain't too bad, but the capacitance has dropped. So this one is, well. 
pretty much junk, and that's why I removed it from the piece of equipment that I, I re took it out of to replace with a new one. So there is another one I'm going to try. One more, and this one is the interesting one. I saved it for last. This is a uh, multi-layer ceramic capacitor, MLCC. Often you'll see these things in um, like the uh, surface mount type components, but this one is a surface mount component that's got leads soldered on, it's dipped in resin, so it becomes a through-hole, and that's a common practice to uh, do that, to make uh, multi-layer ceramics in through-hole. So if I hook that up to the uh, key site, it will read something. 0.467, that's good because it's a, a 0.47 microfarad, and this is actually rated 10 volts. And I'll show you something that happens when we apply voltage to these. So, if I, I'll bump up the, uh, the frequency, we'll go to 10 kilohertz. So that's reading 0.44, right? Yeah, it's not too bad, okay? Now, what happens is, if I turn on the DC bias, Watch what happens when I bring the voltage up. We'll go to we'll go to nine volts. Six, seven, eight, uh, nine volts. You see that? The capacitance dropped when I applied a DC bias to that capacitor, and this is one of the things that catches young players with um, these multi-layer ceramics. As you apply a DC bias. As that DC bias gets uh, close to the rated voltage of the capacitor, your capacitance drops off. Look at that. That's dropped quite a bit. And that, you can actually drop the uh, capacitance out of the uh, specification, the tolerance range of the capacitor. So you've got to watch that with your circuit. If you've got a DC bias, like you're, you're, you're using it as a filter cap to filter out DC, you've got to be careful because if you're running it close to its uh, rated specification, its rated uh, voltage rating, uh, you're going to have a problem with it doing this, dropping off its capacitance, and you, you could end up with your capacitor out of spec, and then your circuit's not going to work right, and you end up chasing your tower, trying to figure out what's going on. There's two ways to get around it. One is you can keep the same voltage rating capacitor and up the capacitance, or you can put a higher voltage rate, uh, capacitor in. See, at the moment, this is a 10-volt uh, rated capacitor, and it's running at 9 volts, so we're at 90% of its rated voltage, and we've dropped off a whole heap of uh, capacitance. If we use, say, a 100 volt rated capacitor at 9 volts, we're going to be at 9% of its rating, which means that capacitance is going to be a lot higher, a lot closer to its rated capacitance. So if you're designing a product, you've just got to do the, uh, the price calculations and see if it's cheaper to put a uh, higher voltage or a higher capacitance capacitor in, assuming you can get the right capacitance, um, uh, the, the right capacitor with the right capacitance rating. So, um, yeah, be careful of that. DC bias on... Um, MLCC capacitors, multi-layer ceramic capacitors, you're going to have a, a bit of a fun time. So this is actually pretty much the reason why, I, well, one of the main reasons I put that DC bias board in was so I could test this when I'm building circuits to see exactly what's going to happen. And then I can uh, properly spec my parts. So that's pretty much all we have to say. Um, we got the system working. The DC bias is definitely working. I'll turn that back down to zero so I don't blow anything up by accident when I turn it on next time. Um, yeah, it seems to be good. There's one thing that I have to do, which I can't do at the moment because I don't have the facilities, is to do a calibration on this thing, but from a first blush, it looks pretty good. It's pretty close to what this one's saying, so it's um, I'll start using it. And uh, I won't bore you with figuring out how I'm going to calibrate it and going through the process because there is a a bit of a long process, but the, the service manual does tell you exactly what to do and what equipment you need, so one day I might um, figure all that out. But it is working good enough for my purposes, so I'm going to give that a thumbs up. I'm really happy that DC bias board was, is working, because that's, um, yeah, I was uh, a little bit unsure about <laughs> the start if, it was gonna, if I was going to be able to pull that off, but it's working perfectly, so yeah. There's a few other um, projects coming up which um, I'm going to be repairing some more board or some more equipment, and they have some options which I might be adding too, because I've uh, gained a little bit of confidence that I can actually do it now. So, that's it. Um, we've got a working meter. That's going to sit on the on the bench, or not on this bench, but on another bench, and it will be um, put into use. Two enthusiastic thumbs up for me. Don't forget, hit that subscribe button down below. Keep watching the videos, and take it easy.